Pastor Darren Tinsley, answering a few questions that come to us uh, via um, social media, live stream, email. <clears throat> we get questions, and as you've seen, we've already posted a question, answering a question as it relates to how, how different should I be or how different do I have to be in order to be saved um, and you see on the video all reforms are necessary so we we talked about that um, this time we're going to answer a question that comes to us and it says um, why won't you work with your local conference and that's the question that comes to us today why uh, am I not working with the local uh, conference well um, before we get into that, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your word, and we pray for understanding. Um, so we ask that you would guide us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So our question again is, why won't you, a question posed to us, why won't you work with your local conference? And um, generally, I, I answer that with, Nothing that I'm doing currently uh, goes against what a local conference should and what the church generally stands for. You know, when you look at the church at large uh, and what is on our books as to what we believe, um, we promote it and we, we, uh, we stand with it. Uh, there are some things that I don't do. Uh, I don't uh, use a Sabbath school quarterly. Um, and I generally use... Uh, lo our local congregation uses the tithe for ministry. Um, we take care of uh, uh, those who are working here in the ministry, as well as those abroad, as we as we uh, so see fit. You know, various people who have uh, committed themselves to the Lord's work and are receiving no compensation, uh, generally, and things they do and they travel and so. Where we can, we support them and, and their particular work. Now, again, some may have or take issues uh, with that. And uh, hopefully we'll cover that in this particular question. So now this section may be a little longer than the last one in the question we're de dealing with. So we want to lay down uh, particular uh, principles when it comes to uh, doing the work and participating in the work. Because generally... As we see what is happening in society, as we see what's happening in our churches, um, ministry, as it relates to the Bible and to the testimony of Jesus, is not being sustained or endorsed by many of our conferences. And generally, why is it being endorsed? Not because wholesale people don't want the truth, a lot of times, a lot of pressure comes from not supporting various ministries is the local pastors. The pastors have gone to Andrews and Southern and Oakwood and have gotten these huge amounts of debt in school. And so they feel that you should, um, uh, uh, you know, get in the get in line as um, some of their maybe their their. Um, co-workers per se. Maybe there are some people they went to school with who don't have churches and who have not received an invitation um, or calling per se to go and pass in a, in a particular conference. And here you are as someone who didn't go to their schools, don't endorse their schools, and yet you have started this local congregation um, of just people who wanted, who for various reasons have stopped going to their local churches. Uh, and have decided to come together and be taught um, from the Word of God. And so you have a lot of pushback from the pastors why you don't see a lot of, a lot of churches being supported in this line. Now, some would say, well, we should only have ministries. We're going to deal with that, too, in this, in this format. So, generally, I don't use the Sabbath school quarterly and the, again the tithes that we use they go to support the work now someone might add on to that 
Have I gone to my local conference and tried to work with them? No, I've not tried to waste their time and or waste mine. And you say, well, how can you say that? Because you can look at the, the churches now and see what they're actually doing. To know that to go and sit down with them would be a, you would be wasting, uh, wasting your time. Uh, since I've been here, um, some of the local elders and deacons have come to where we are. Uh, and even the pastor uh, that was over the one of the churches did come to one of our meetings. And generally it was cordial. It was, you know, I, I don't hear anything. Members have come. Hey, I, you know, they don't preach anything that we don't believe as a people. I mean, we're not hearing it at our church, but generally, you know, they. But again, the response is we don't need another church in this area. We have enough Seven Adventist churches in this area. Um, when you have a population that is um, on the advance towards on the higher end of 300,000 people, the population of Augusta, um, you have over 200 uh, Baptist churches in Augusta area alone. Um, and I think spread out over um, um, Grovetown, Augusta, and Aiken, three separate cities, you have 11 Seven Adventist churches. So you have 11 Seven Adventist churches, and you have over 200 listed in the phone book Baptist churches. But the excuse is we do not need more Seven Adventist churches. And I, I, I don't believe that. I believe that his statement was we don't need churches of this kind in this particular area. We don't need churches who are not kind of going down the same road we're going. We don't need we don't need those type of churches in this particular area. Um, same thing was thought of when Edson White began the Southern work, the Morning Star. And his work was from its inception to its end was not endorsed by the brethren. Why? Because he did not come and get permission. He did not receive their official sanction or their, or, or their endorsement. And the work in which he was doing was um, pretty much something that they did not feel the need to do. And so this is generally why we see this pushback. So in this study, we're going to look at Edson White. We're going to look at John the Baptist. We're going to look at Christ. And we're going to, again, just look at what we are to be doing as it relates to ministry and why it's necessary at this juncture of, of our church history, why this type of work is necessary. Not just GYCs, um, good for, for, what it, uh, for what it initially can and should do, but we don't just need what GYC is doing, going around from city to city, just having meetings, um, um, trying to inspire people. Good. Army goes around and they, they try to inspire people. You know, Ivor, he tries to get people into the Word of God. That's good. But we can't just stop there. We can't stop there. Why? Because we see that there is a direct attack, not from without, but from within, to destroy the movement that God has set on foot. And many of our universities, our young people, are being confused when they sit in the theology classes at Oakwood, at Andrews, at PUC, at Southern. Um, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're confused as it relates to spirituality, to the gospel, uh, the mission that God has given to this church. Uh, we see all that's happening in the NAD. And so what Army is doing, what GYC is doing, what Souls West is doing, it's, it's good, but it cannot just stop there with these quote-unquote movements that are there to encourage and inspire the people. And we're going to see that as we go into this section uh, here. So I, I want to read a couple of uh, statements um, as it relates to Edson White's Southern work. Okay, I'm going to read a statement that Sister White, uh, Sister White makes towards Edson White. And we're also going to read a statement 
that the angel gave to Sister White as it relates to Edson's word. Now let's look at these two statements. It says, you ask me, as this is Sister White speaking to Edson White, you ask me what you should do for so little help is given to that portion of the field where you are working. Trust it all to the Lord. There is a way open for you in regard to the southern field. This is what she says. Appeal to the people. This is the only course you can pursue under the circumstances. She says, send no statement of the situation through our religious papers, our religious papers, because it will not be honored. Send direct to the people. In other words, she said, listen, son, here you are in the South. You have received so little help. Why is that so little help? Because he put together tracts and books and he would give them to the church to print so that he could then take the money and use them to sustain his work. But they would take his books, they would give it to the car porters. When the money would come in, they wouldn't give it to Edson White. They would send it to other places. Um, they would try to, quote unquote, recoup their money from the printing. Um, and so by the time Edson White got the money from the books he put together, um, it was very little to, to do anything with it. And so now she's, he's appealing to his mother, the prophet, saying, what should I do? And she says, listen, don't go through the conference. Do not send the situation. Don't put it in our papers. Don't put it in the Pacific Press. Don't put it in a review and all. Why? Because it is not going to be honored because of the powers that be that do not endorse this line of work will not allow this material to get before the people as it should get before the people. Now notice what she says again, going on. She says, send no statement of the situation through our religious papers because it will not be honored. Send direct to the people. So what was she encouraging him to do? Start a newsletter. She was encouraging him to take what he's doing. Now, let me say this. Do not use, because I, I, I believe many people who will look to this are people who are trying to do the work. And that is, do not put in the newsletter what you intend or what you want to do. If you're going to write a newsletter, write about what you have already done. Write about the success you've had. Write about the difficulties that you're now experiencing and then ask for help. Don't ask for help for a startup. All right. Um, no one wants to invest in an idea. So it says, send direct to the people. God's ways are not to be counterwork by man's ways. It says, there are those who have means and will give. Some small sums, some large sums. But ha notice this. But have it come direct to your destitute portion of the vineyard. The Lord, notice this, the Lord has not specified any regular channel through which means should pass. So again, the whole notion that many have drummed up with this storehouse idea, um, you know, is, is, is fallacious. Um, at best. But notice it says, the Lord has not specified any direct, any regular channel through which means should pass. There are those, again, I'm going back now, there are, those, there are those who have means and will give, some small, some large, but have it come direct to your destitute portion of the vineyard. So the money was to come directly to Edson White. It was to come directly to the field in which he was working. So what was he to do? He was to go around the conference. He was not to wait upon brethren in high places 
to have an epiphany or a revelation in the night season like Nebuchadnezzar um, to support this work. It needed to be done, and thus he went forth doing it. Now, let's look here again. I'm switching over. That was taken from 21 manuscripts. Um, 21 manuscripts, uh, page uh, 266. Now I'm reading from three manuscripts, and this is what the angel says in regards to Edson White. When Edson White's letter presented the work that he was doing in the South, what was his work? Um, by his boat. His boat was used as a meeting house. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to highlight or write down meeting house because we're, we're going to address that meeting house in a, uh, as we move forward. But notice this. His boat was used as a meeting house. When he told of the gathering of the children for the Sabbath school, so we have a meeting house, we have a school, watch this now, um, of the invitations he had received to hold meetings, of the souls that were becoming interested in these meetings, of the naked to be clothed, and the sick to be helped. All right, so watch this now. We have a meeting house, we have a school, and we have medical missionary work. All right, so three entities that he's developing here. Where is he developing them? From his boat. Keep those points in mind. You're going to need them as we move forward. It says, so he's doing all this and nothing in the way of means, finances, to carry forward the work. The work that should be done was presented to me in the night season. Not only was there presented to me the field in which he was at work, but several uh, places were in the providence of God, he would be called to work. Let's stop for a moment. So, so far, Edson White has started three industries. He's three entities, okay? He started a meeting house, a school, and a medical missionary work, okay? Practical work, all right? No means have come to him. This is a work that was to be done in the providence of God. Not only was the prophet shown his field and where he was laboring, but several other places that in the providence of God, he would eventually go. To do what? To do the same type of work. No means were coming to him. What was he to do? According to the last quotation, he was to put together a newsletter. Uh, pardon me, he was to put together a newsletter and he was to send it out directly to the people, not to be put in the Pacific Press, not to be put in the Adventist Review, uh, not to be put on one of the church blog sites. He was to send it directly to the people. And the people, with their finances, were not to send it to the GYC and stamp your check. No, it was to come directly to him. This money was to come directly to his destitute field to use as he saw fit. All right? Now, let's keep moving. All right? It says this. So now, this is what she saw needed to be done. All right? In the province of God. She says, The eager faces, the earnest desire, the hunger of soul expressed were before me. And I said, what can we do for these people that are now so interested when the situation is so discouraging? Why? You have to ask yourself the question. Why was the situation so discouraging? Because the brethren who sat in offices um, in uh, the North American division didn't see no light in this work. They saw no light in doing this practical work. Now, we may look today and say, well, they do see light in it today, brothers and sisters, again. What you're seeing in our churches goes directly against the ministry of Christ and the book Ministry of Healing. What we're seeing with the promotion of doctors being supported by the, M the, the AMA, which doesn't make all doctors bad per se, but what you see when the term medical missionary and health work is mentioned by the 
North American division, it is talking about doctors who have been licensed by the board, who have gone to colleges and got medical degrees, and who have learned how to medicate, slash, and burn. It is not talking about medical missionaries who study herb, who read the book Ministry of Healing, and who have a desire and a, and a desire to win and help people. This is not what they are referring to. Now we can twist it in our minds to say this is what they do mean, when in actuality it is not what they mean. All right. Now notice this. She says, my God, I'm continuing now, in the light of Edson White, my God said, speaking of an angel, this work will be sowing seed for time and for eternity. And then the instruction was given. The angels of the Lord will go before him. Now watch what it says. He will be accounted out of line. But many ought to be out of the lines that have been maintained to be the regular routine. And unless they themselves come into line, they will say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are we, unless that temple is purified, cleansed, sanctified. God will not give them his presence in the temple of which they boast. Now, so they will, they will say, they will say that we're the temple, we're the church. And if anything is to be done, it is to be done by us. It is to be endorsed and stamped and approved by us. This is what the angels said they will say. This is what we're seeing. Many of the ministries that we're seeing today have, to a great degree, pledged themselves to ASI not to infringe upon the, upon the status quo. They have pledged themselves by signing those bills uh, those uh, pledges by ASI that they are not going to, they're not going to step out of line with the status quo. They're not going to undermine the physicians. And I don't believe you have to undermine physicians. However, the principles upon which God is calling us to operate in are offensive to many nurses and many doctors. But if you have signed with ASI, then you have pledged yourself to go along the status quo. This is why when you see a lot of people talking about hell and talking about God's plan, who do they have validating what they're saying? Dr. So-and-so, uh, MD so-and-so. They don't have medical missionaries on there who don't have degrees um, validating what they say from the Bible. They have doctors showing to the world that, hey, you can work with the AMA and still get your message out. You don't have to, you don't have to rock the boat in order to do it God's way as they, as they, as they deem. So again, if we are, if we do not study to show ourselves approved, then we're going to be led astray by a lot of things today that has, that has come under the, um, ha that has kind of thrown over the cloak of medical missionary to draw the church to support it, but in, to draw the members, I should say, in to support it. But in reality, it is nothing more than alternative medicine. It is not what God has given us. It is alternative medicine. And you go to Duke University and, and see that they're talking about alternative medicine. You go to um, um, North Carolina and there, there, there are many secular campuses that have and do studies in alternative medicine. Okay, so this is not what God is asking us to do. What we see Edson White doing, it was done without the support of the brethren. Now, I want us to notice something here. Let me finish this and, and then we're gonna, we'll move forward. It said the situation was again presented. And the urgency of occupying the fields that were presented to me, then being worked under the supervision of God only now, under the supervision of God, using Edson White 
as his agency to open the field. But there, but there were no others that would think of touching that portion of the field or would engage in working it. Those, we are told, those who should have rejoiced to see something done were determined to give no recognition to Edson White or the work because he did not work in the regular lines. So they saw what Edson White was doing and they turned their heads as if that they are not going to endorse it. And today the conference has turned its head to this work. They have turned their faces away. Why? Because they believe they're the temple. And what have they done? They have virtually stifled the work from being done. And many who are well capable to do the work that Edson White had done, the reason why they don't do it is because of the fear the Pharisees is upon them. And they seek to discourage as much as possible. This is why often you have ministries um, who would stand up and always throw out disclaimers about who they are not and what they are not trying to do, thus not to be labeled as such. They don't want the labels and so they put up these disclaimers and they, 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 they it's open season on anyone who is not necessarily endorsed by the conference. So you find many ministries that will stand up and will talk ill about the line that I may be working in. Why? Because it's fair game to, to, to mention, to, to speak ill about what I'm doing. And that's fine. I realize, I realize it's hunting season. So I'm not bothered by that. But those, again, who want to get in ministry, you have to understand, it's open season on this type of work. They'll get up and they'll, they'll put a video out and they'll, they'll, they'll talk ill and they'll disqualify this type of work and they won't say anything about anything else. And that's fine, but you have to understand that when you engage in this work, you're not going to receive the countenance of the conference when you do it this way. Now, if you're going to do it their way, you can stand outside for a couple of days with your, with your and naked feet and your uh, head uncovered. And then they'll let you go and minister in, your, uh, in, in a local field that is approved and watched over by committees and by local pastors who can care less about this particular word. Why? Because you didn't go to their schools. So here we have Edson White as an example. We have Edson White who had to, who had a burden by God, who had a desire to do the Lord's work. And because of his desire, he gathered up the statements that Spirit of Prophecy said concerning the southern field and how it was being neglected. And he launched out into the deep. He took his net and he cast it on the other side. And when he cast his net on the other side, that's when he began to see the spiritual apathy of the church in his day, which is still alive. And relevant in our day. Now, I want to look at another quote. I want to uh, put these down, and I want to go to the to now again. There are three things I told you to keep down: meeting house, churches for schools, and medical missionary work. Okay, those three things we're going to eventually come back to. But I want to make this. I want to write this. Uh, make mention of a statement here um, as we come to the individual member. Um, and oh, let me say this prior to reading this. When you look at the work that Edson White did, did Edson White in any way, in any way, he wasn't calling members to break away from their local churches and come and support him. He wasn't asking members to, to stop and, and, you know, don't go to your local churches anymore and, 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 and don't go here and don't go there. Just support me. That's not what Edson White was doing. So, and the reason why I say that is because the fear that people drum up when you start talking about this word is, so should, should everybody leave the churches? That's not what S.M. White did. That's not what, um, uh, that was not being promoted by him, neither being pro promoted in spirit of prophecy. But there was a work that needed to be done that was being neglected. 
And so Edson White appealed to those people whose heart was burdened with the word. White appealed to, uh, to do that work, not to the leaders of the church. He appealed to the members because that's where the soul of the work lies. It lies with the members and not with the leadership of this church. Sadly, but that is the reality of it. It does not lie with the leadership of the church. It, it really doesn't lie with the pastors to a great degree. As it relates to where we are today, it lies with the members. And that's who Edson White appealed to, to support the work, not to leave their places and come down to where he was in the South and Tennessee and Mississippi. He didn't ask for that, but he needed support to do the work. And then God raised up individuals who call porters, medical missionaries, who attached themselves to this work. And again, had the endorsement of God and the prophet. Let's look. Notice what it says here. It says, it is time, reading from Spalding McGann, page 195. It is time that the church members understood that everywhere there is a work to be done in the Lord's vineyard. No one is to wait for a regular process before they make any efforts. We're not to wait for a church appeal, wait for regular efforts. They should take up the work right where they are. There should be many at work in what are called the irregular lines. If 100 laborers would step out of the regular lines and take up self-sacrificing work, such as Brother Simon did, we'll, we'll study his character later on, such as Brother Simon has done, souls would be won to the Lord. And the workers, watch this, and the workers would manifest, would, and the workers would understand by experience what it means to be a laborer together with God. If church members would begin to work, step out of the regular lines, and start working like Brother Simon did, what did Brother Shiman do? Um, uh, there's a statement here which tells us exactly what he did. Um, let's see which one I want to read first. What did he do? It says, God has been pleased with the work of Brother Shiman, um, with the work that Brother Shiman has done, and arousing an interest in the educational work and in, and in erecting church and school buildings in uh, Hills, Hills de Brand, North Carolina. Now, I want to make mention of this. To this very day in North Carolina, it is owned by a Baptist church. One of the churches that Brother Sherman had built, the property is owned by a Baptist congregation. They still have the building there as a memorial. They don't have services in it. They built another big building on the same property, but they have Brother Shiman's building still on their property in North Carolina, a church that Brother Shiman had built. And I believe it was sometime last year that some conference officials and various people went to North Carolina and took a picture and put it in the Columbia Union. And who did they give honor to? Brother Shiman. Okay, so now, here his work is still standing today. And yet, off of this, and what we're already studying, people will tell you, you, you shouldn't start churches. Brothers and sisters, again, this is why you have to study and read and you'll understand. So again, I, I mentioned Brother Shiman because the prophet does. What he did, we are told, is an object lesson for us today as a people. Now, um, so we just, in a nutshell, we looked at Edson White's work very briefly. And we talked about three specific things he did. And I'm going to address those in a moment. We talked about... God's appeal for his people to come out of the regular line of doing things and enter into the line that Brother Sherman entered into, which is the same line that Edson White was in. Okay, church building, 
educational work, all right? And so here we find these individuals working in this particular capacity. Now, I want us to, if we can, I want us to run to John the Baptist. I want us to look at Christ, and then I want to look at their characters together as it relates to um, the church of their time, which is, again, where we are today as a people. Okay, so I'm going to go to Desire of Ages. And if you have the book Desire of Ages, you can turn first to the page of 132. Uh, the chapter is, We Have Found the Messiahs. Okay, this is John the Baptist. Um, and, 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 and this is um, kind of the, um, you know, I guess the foundation of his working. All right? You can read Voice in the Wilderness uh, to get a further understanding. But notice what it says. In Desire of Ages, page 132 going into 133. Now, what is with John the Baptist? Okay. And again, this is all dealing with our question. Pastor Tinsley, why are you not working with your local conference? Because of this very thing right here. Uh, not because you have disdain for conferences. It is because the average conference has disdain for the Lord's work. And they show it time and time again. They show it time and time again. They have a disdain for the Lord's work. And because I don't have this fear of being labeled as something, I don't have this fear of or believing that my I'm not going to be able to work unless I can only preach in Adventist churches. I don't have that fear. Um, I don't have to uh, pretend and smile at people when you know that they don't like you. You can just shake hands with them. I know the local pastor here. I know what he said to people about me. I know what he had to say. But whenever I saw him, we shook hands and we talked. I don't have to. I don't. I don't. I don't have to pretend and kowtow and pretend. I don't. I don't have to do that because not because I'm confident in who I am. It's because I believe the word of God. I receive it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the words of God. So this is why I do what I do. And again, it's not that you don't want to work with the conference. It's that the conference, generally, because of the way they are established, are not willing to work with uh, the way that God has said things should be done. You're not willing to just baptize people just because they come to a meeting, um, just so you could put... Uh, say that you baptize people so you can get to evangelism council and tout how many people you baptize um, because you're not willing to uh, uh, just bring people into any type of environment um, and have them sit and listen to this conf uh, confusion. And so because you're not willing to do that, you have to work, you have to, you have to do it God's way. So unless you're just going to go to church, unless you're just going to get people riled up, and as they start studying, they're going to say, hey, wait a minute, I can't keep going to this church. I can't stay here. Yes, I believe what you just said. And because I believe what you said, I can't keep sitting in this environment. But in order so you don't get a label, you tell the people, stay there. Help somebody else in that environment. But notice, this is John the Baptist. Um, page 132, going into 133. It says, John, this is John now, John... Well, I'll start in the back. It said, The preaching of John had taken so deep a hold on the nation as to demand the attention of the religious authorities. The danger of insurrection caused every popular gathering to be looked upon with suspicion by the Romans. And whatever, and whatever pointed toward an uprising of the people excited the fears of the Jewish uh, rulers. So much there, but we'll deal with that another time. John had not, notice now, <clears throat> this is a point. John had not recognized the authority of the Sanhedrin by seeking their sanction for his work. And he had reproved rulers, <clears throat> people, Pharisees, and Sadducees alike. Though he had not deferred to them, the Sanhedrin accounted that as a public teacher, he was under their jurisdiction. So now John the Baptist did not go to them to receive approval. John the Baptist did not go to his local synagogue 
and ask, can he meet with a group of people in the wilderness? Though he did not recognize them, they felt that because John was in, in that particular area, they had jurisdiction over him. And thus, they felt that they could control who comes, what he does, and what he should and should not do. John did not uh, recognize them, nor did John go to them and ask their approval. He didn't do it. All right? So again, as our example, why did John not go to them? Well, if you read the chapter, The Voice in the Wilderness, if you read the chapter, Nicodemus, if you read the chapter, Chosen People, um, you would see, um, in the fullness of time, you would see why God did not send John to talk to them. And today, God is not sending his people to sit and meet with local conference elders. Why? Because they see no light in this truth. And that is, and that is the reality. God is not sending his mess, chosen messengers. God is not sending his people to go and ask conference leaders, should I work in this particular vineyard? Why? Because they don't see light in this work. How do you know they're not doing it? And I could name you churches who have been killed and ran out of town, as it were, um, because they tried to work alongside conferences that saw no light in what they do. They tried to do everything to appease a conference. We'll give you all the tithe. We won't take up any offerings. All we'll do is have studies on Sabbath. And guess what? We're not even going to meet during the main 11 o'clock hour. We're going to send them to their local churches. And we'll meet in the evening. And we're not going to take any offerings. We're going to let them know. If you want to put in offerings, go to your local churches. What more can we do? They're, they're old swami. They're, they're, I'm being facetious, but the reality is ministries have done everything possible to appease conference leaders only for the conference leaders on for enough. Shut the meeting down. Thank you for the money. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. But y'all have to shut this church down. And this is what, and this is what they have got. Now, again, was the burden of God? Or were they working to be recognized by men? Man, I want to get my name in the review. I want people to know that I'm doing a work. And the conference said, man, we don't respect your work. And all of a sudden they go back down and they get sad. And someone comes along and says, well, all you need to do is start a ministry. And that's what they do. And do what? Allow the members to be beat up and, and kicked down by these pastors who do not care for the truth. So again, this is the way that many people want to work. Hey, I'm not trying to discourage them from working that way. Um, and they can work that way. Hey, I, I have no problem with it. I have no problem preaching at conference churches. I've been invited to many of them. Um, and only to, to, to find out that uh, they, they, many of these churches, small churches, have these pastors who pastor the larger churches are destroying the little churches as well. So you can do whatever you want to try to appease the Caiaphas and Ananias mindset. It's not going to work. Now, let's move forward. All right, now we're going to Desire of Ages, page 294. Desire of Ages 294, all right? Okay, so again, this is a, I wanted to give you an understanding. So as you start to work, you will recognize why things are the way they are. So you don't have to be discouraged when, when, when conference leaders and pastors don't agree with you, when they start sending out letters. You don't have to worry about that. You can know. Christ says, I tell you before it come to pass, so that when it come to pass, you will believe. Notice, this is our age is 294. It said the disciples now, now notice, this is the disciples. The disciples had been much disappointed that Jesus had not tried to secure the cooperation of the leaders and Israel. They felt that it was a mistake not to strengthen his cause by securing the support of these influential men. So the disciples, even the disciples who worked with Christ, felt that Christ was working in a way that wasn't wise. They felt that Christ needed to be working with the conference needed the support of the brethren. He needed to, to, to do whatever it take 
to get inside the churches, even if that means that you do not preach certain subjects. Okay? Don't preach certain subjects just as long as you get in. This is what the disciples felt, and this is what you're going to find. Many people you talk to today who come under the guise of present truth will have you to believe that this is how you must work. This is because if you, if you, if you deal with sin, if you deal with real apostasy in the church, you're going to cut short your ministry. So prolong your ministry the best you can by joining the harmless dove movement. And once you join that movement, then it'll be a piece of cake from then on out. Yeah, you'll have to compromise certain things. Yeah, you know, you'll, you know, you'll have to wear makeup um, to go on 3ABN. Yes, you, you, know, you, you won't be able to you know, preach about certain things. Yeah, you're not going to be able to really talk about what's going on at our institutions. Yeah, you're not going to be able to um, you know, endorse. You, 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 you can't be seen in pictures around certain people anymore. You, know, you kind of have to say hi, but you, know, you can't. You know, don't make any statements on certain people's pages because you don't want, you know, someone to see that statement. So, you know, you, you're going to have to kind of be a harmless dove. You're going to have to be harmless to where you're not threatening to anybody if you want to get ahead. And this is what they felt Christ um, should do uh, when he worked. But notice what the end result would be. It says, it said the cooperation. Notice what Jesus says. It says, the cooperation of such men as the disciples were anxious to secure would be betrayed. Um, The the cooperation of such men as the disciples were anxious to secure would have betrayed the work into the hands of its worst enemies. And we see it. Last quotation from Desire of Ages, and then we're going to move on to another statement. It says in Desire of Ages, now this is... John the Baptist in Christ. These are the Pharisees in John chapter 6, 7, referring to Christ and making insinuations about John. I want you to notice what it says here. All wondered, I'm reading from page 453 of Desire of Ages. It says, All wondered at his knowledge of the law, speaking of Christ, and the prophecies. And the question passed from one another How know if this man letters having never learned? Now, this is the key. No one was regarded as qualified to be a religious teacher unless he had studied in the rabbinical schools. And both Jesus and John the Baptist had been presented as ignorant because they had not received this training. Because John and Jesus did not go to Andrews, Oakwood, and PUC, and Southern, because they were not endorsed by ASI, they were not recognized as religious teachers. So again, this is the mindset today. Many of your pastors do not endorse people having churches unless they go to school and get some type of qualifications. Okay? So now you might cite a few individuals who are allowed to abide over companies, um, but who eventually at some time, uh, either online or some other course, go and get a degree uh, so that they can pass to these churches. Now, again, I'm not saying that there are no exceptions to the rule, yet and still, the type of work in which God has asked us to do is to a great degree, um, not endorsed. Why? Because they would, as it were, open the floodgates for many people to start doing ministry who did not go to the schools and get license, per se, to do this work. So you can be a car porter, you can be a Bible worker, you know, you can even occasionally preach, but you are not to be taken And I'll say this seriously until you go to their schools. You're not to be really taken seriously. um, And you're not to be given too much credibility until you go through their line of education and until you fit into into that mold. Okay. Now, having said that, 
I said that I mentioned three things in regards to what uh, Edson White did. Meeting house, school, health work. Okay. Now, I want you to notice, taken from volume six now, volume six of testimonies, there's a chapter called, um, make sure I get back to it. There's a chapter called uh, Camp Meeting. Okay, there's a section called Camp Meeting in Volume 6 of the Testimonies. And this is a very important section because it outlines the workforce. Okay, so I'll, we'll, we'll end on this note and then we'll pick it up um, in another section dealing with another question that will bring us somewhat back around to this again anyway. So we're not going to exhaust it, but here it is. You find that in the volume six of the testimonies under the chapter called camp meeting it is there is a blueprint that is laid out about how this work is to be done there's a blueprint that is given to god's people and in this particular blueprint we are told how we must work in this particular blueprint now there are three things that are to be um, that are to be addressed and that are to come out of the camp meeting. Three things. Edson White had all three: the meeting house, the school, and the health work. Okay? Now let's look at this. So after the camp meeting, I'm looking at the uh, when you get is 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 the, the follow-up work that is to be done. Now, generally, the term camp meeting, we have reduced it to meaning that it's a large congregation of Adventists that come and we hear messages. But when this was the true context of camp meetings relates to not only our church members, but it relates to largely to the public meeting to, to non-Adventists. If you look at the, the, the um, introduction to the book, evangelism you'll find there where it says in our camp meetings in the early days there was a ratio of uh, i believe it was 15 or maybe 11 anywhere from 11 to 15 to 1 one adventist to 11 or 15 non-adventists that was the ratio that attended our camp meetings so for every one adventist you had 11 to 15 non-adventists Today, primarily, you have every Adventist, you have another Adventist. And non-Adventists are not necessarily encouraged to come. She talks about our locations for having these meetings, where we should not have them predominantly, and what should be the outlook. Yes, we should minister to the people, but they are to be, they are to be trained to minister and to work for for the neighboring communities that would attend the various meetings and so again we must get back to that and in getting back to that our conferences getting back to that and again it's no but you may say well why don't you go to the conference why go why waste their time why not why not do the work and if they desire to do it it doesn't matter who starts it right it's about god it's about Christ getting the glory. It's not about man, right? So it doesn't matter who started. If it's done and it's a blessing, then anyone can take the word. Amen? So it don't matter. So you don't have to go per se because you're not trying to undermine them. You're not trying to cut the legs from under them. You're not trying to get any glory. You're not trying to, you know, um, build some mega million dollar ministry where you need millions of dollars to sustain. Now, if you're trying to do that, then, you know, that's another conversation in and of itself. But in reality, it doesn't matter who does it as long as it gets done. But this is how we have been that it should be done. Now watch this. So in the follow-up meeting, notice what she says here. She says, this is page 100, wherever a company of believers is raised up, a house of worship should be built. Let not the workers leave the place without accomplishing this. So once you set up a camp meeting, she says the workers that come should not leave that city until a church is built for those people who are interested. But if you have a whole group of Adventists that's coming, I guess you may argue the point. You don't need it. But if we're doing it the way that we are told, 
then these are some of the things we need to take into consideration. Okay, I'm skipping forward now. I'm skipping forward to uh, children's school meetings. Okay, this is taken from page uh, 108. Same book, 108. It says, while an interest of both parents and children is awakened, it is a golden opportunity to, for the establishment of a school at which the work begun at camp meeting can be carried forward. As the believers are raised up and churches organized, such a school will be found a great value in promoting the permanence of the stability of the work. So a church and a school should follow up as a result of our camp meetings. Let's move forward. Okay, I'm going over to page uh, 113. It says, in every city where we have a church, there is need of a place where treatment can be given among the homes of our church members. There are many that afford room and facilities for the proper care of the sick. So three things primarily, church, school, health work, is to be started as a result of our camp meetings. And you have to ask yourself, which conference does this? Which conference is willing to do this? Because I could tell you that Georgia Cumberland um, is not willing to do it. I could tell you that, and that's the only one generally I know, I'm not really uh, too savvy on conferences and their names, but the reality is, why do you know they're not willing to do it? Because do they have it? No. If they don't have it, that means they're not willing to do it. And if they are willing to do it, then someone needs to do it. Rather than going to them and asking for all this startup money, just do it. Do it. Take up the work where it lies nearest. Okay? So, again, the thing, you have to do it. And, again, you're not going to get the support from your local conferences. You don't believe me? Ask through ABN. Danny Shelton told us, um, Jim Gilly told us, C.A. Murray told us, when uh, 3ABM's uh, 30th anniversary came up, the conferences thought Danny Shelton was crazy. But he started it, and now look at what everyone's doing. Now everyone is gloating and happy about 3ABN. Um, I believe they're more happy uh, what has happened over the last few years than, than the previous years. Um, but again, that's another conversation. But the reality is, everyone is happy now. But if Danny Shelton had sat down with the religious leaders in the 80s, you wouldn't have no 3ABN. It wouldn't be there. And so, you have to, sadly, ministries are being forced to work outside the conference line. They're being forced. But again, God has opened the door. And God has given us endorsement to work outside the conference lines. He has given us endorsement to start churches outside of the conference line. Are these churches to take away? No. Um, are they trying to organize themselves and, and become legal so they can't be sued? No. So everything outside of conference is not sanctified. And everything that is inside conference is not, is not um, um, wicked, if I could use that word. So everything in the conference is not bad, and everything out of the conference is not good, and vice versa. Everything in the conference is not good, and everything out of the conference is not bad. What saith the Lord? And this is why we must look at the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. So again, in the long, short answer, um, this is why I don't work with any directly with any particular conference. And there are some other things, and, and we'll cover that in our next section. So thank you for your question. God bless.